So as I've indicated, a wrong view of the Almighty God, and um, before I go any further, I believe that one thing I've always sought to do uh, as, as I've brought the Word of God to you is to every now and then bring to you these, these views, these biblical perspectives and uh, understandings of how God reveals himself to be, because it's so important. It's vital that we have a grasp of how God reveals himself, not how we want him to be revealed to us, or how people imagine him to be revealed, but how the Bible reveals God in all of his attributes and his, person, his being and within the uh, three persons of the Trinity, uh, the Godhead. So a wrong view of God, therefore, even a view that I would say is impaired or clouded or dimmed in some way, what will it do? It will lead to all sorts of error and it will lead to disaster, uh, really as its final conclusion. It's one of the features of this world in which we live. You go outside the, uh, the doors of this church and you start to engage in conversation and when you start to speak to people about where they stand and who they are before God and what they think of God and what they think of themselves, what you'll find that by and large, people tend to think that they are respectable um, within society. And, and they have done a few things which are wrong, they admit to this, um, but they are so keen and so quick to look elsewhere to justify themselves. And so when they want to feel as if they are integral, and they are just, and they are good, and they are righteous in their own eyes, uh, they will be able to present someone else who is always a lot worse than what they are in their moral qualities and character. The problem is that when people act in such a way like this, they take that same measuring stick, or we might say a barometer or a gauge, and what they do when it comes to thoughts of eternity in their own soul and where they stand before God and even the revelation of religion in scriptures, you will find that man, if I just use that particular term this evening, he will take up that same way of analyzing things, that is that human means of analyzation, and will say, well, you know, I'm not perfect, but I deserve to go to heaven, if they have a belief in heaven, that is. And if they don't, well, of course, they just reject these things altogether. Even the Christian can fall into a very similar trap and snare. You might not think it, but we do on occasions. When in our Christian life, we start to compare ourselves with other Christians. And we start to judge ourselves by the actions of other people. And that, of course, is detrimental, not just to the church, but to our own growth in grace as professing Christians. Because what will always be the problem is this. What is acceptable to one person is not always going to be acceptable to someone else. And what is right to someone else is not always right to you. And so again, we bring ourselves back to the absolute truths and revelations of God's word where he does set down the standard. And he does provide the rule. And it's by this we interpret all things and we understand all things. For example, if you were in a math subject, one of the things I used to despise at school, and there were a few subjects on the sort of wish list of I wish they never existed, and maths was one of them. And to uh, sort of my astonishment, whenever I met with Naomi, I discovered she was the mathematical one. Uh, probably that sort of tells you all I need to know because um, I needed someone on that side when it comes to these sort of things. I'm happy with books. I'm happy with writing. I'm happy with that side of, of uh, academics and learning. But you give me fractions and decimal points and all that sort of thing. Uh, even the children with the homework, uh, my first response is, well, what did your mum say? Uh, and before I give you uh, my answer, or what does Google say? Is, uh, that's the best way. But I'm trying to learn, uh, even in these uh, years of my life. But just for example, if we take a ruler that, that um, marks out, say, um, 30 centimeters, but in reality, it's only 20 centimeters long, then whenever you're trying to measure a, a further distance or some particular distance, of course, there's going to be confusion if your scales are broken, if they're not reading as they should. Of course, you can't get an accurate reading altogether. And that, in, in a way, is how mankind is. They have taken their life, and they've taken their actions, and they've weighed it upon their own scales, and they've come up with a reading. That's okay. That's fine by me. But, of course, it hasn't been set by God. It hasn't been arranged by the Almighty. There is no reference to the Word of God. We come now to an instance where 
even a man of God, even Job, who is one of the pillars when it comes to you know, men of faith within the scriptures, even Job, who from the very outset of Job is known to be an integral, upright man of God, we still discover that he had much to learn when it came to understanding his own heart, understanding his relationship to the Almighty God. And we see that when we come to the end of chapter 42. Job, as we know, and I don't need to repeat certain things this evening, as I've often made reference and we, we know the story very well, he had gone through life experiences that probably most people cannot comprehend. And I trust, God willing, that we will never go through to the extent that Job did. And not only did he suffer in such a way, but you think of all the advice or the sort of so-called advice that came his way and the uh, instruction that was given to him, the words of, well, trying to be helpful counsel. Think of the, the questions he put upon his own life. Uh, the, the struggle within the middle of Job that he had within his own heart in respect to what God was actually doing in his life. And after all the things he suffered, as we shall explore a bit more uh, this evening, and what he said and what others said to him, finally God speaks. God talks. And you know, I don't think it's very any different when it comes to you know, our present day and how the Lord works. So often the Lord will allow people to, to go so far. As you hear some testimonies, they've, they've tried everything. They've gone so far. They've heard all the advice under the sun. And they've come to conclude, it doesn't give me any answers. And Job now comes at the end. And it seems to be a, a long time before God is speaking to him. But in the end, he does speak. And as we know from those last two chapters there, before chapter 42, it is question upon question that God gives to Job. It doesn't really give him the answers, because that's not the idea here. Every question stripped away in argument. Every question revealed an insufficiency within Job's understanding. And every question showed Job just how powerful how wise God is. And in all of that, God is pleased to reveal himself more fully to Job. Now when Job see, saw this, he then saw himself. So it's, for example, when you um, uh, put a pair of glasses on, if you need to wear glasses. If you don't, and you put them on, it doesn't really help, of course. Uh, but when your eyes are not very good, and uh, you put the glasses on, and, and you see everything then in in uh, focus, I, I say sometimes, no, we don't need to have HD because I just put glasses on and everything's high definition. If I take them off, then, of course, it's back to a very poor definition. But that's something like Job here. It, it dawns on him. He sees God. And it means that it, it's never the case that we come to a place, our life is the people of God where, well, we know it all now. We've seen all the views, and we know all there is to know about God. No, ever learning, ever growing in grace. Ever being amazed as we view him in all of his splendor. I think this is a message not just for the unsaved, it's for our hearts, who are the Lord's. As we see God, and then we see ourselves. Now, before I go any further, just let's remind ourselves and refresh ourselves here. In verses 3 to 5, Job had answered the Lord. So there are words which were given before you come to uh, the likes of verse 5 and verse 6. And you will discover that Job is beginning to realize his inadequacy to answer God when he's confronted with might, wisdom, and power. And what does Job do? He silences himself. He stops himself. Just stop. That's what he says. Behold, you see there in, in the scriptures uh, when he speaks in chapter 42 and in verse uh, three and four and so forth. Um, he, he shows himself, or rather, sorry, I'm, I've lost my place here, chapter 40 and verses three to five. Uh, Job answers in chapter 40, verses three to five. He says, behold, I am vile. What should I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will answer yea twice, but I will proceed no further. Uh, but what you find is that then in chapter 42, in verse 2, that he lets out this godly sorrow and confession. So while there in chapter 40, he's 
very um, quick to silence himself and say, you know, I've got nothing else to say. It's only when the Lord begins to further speak to him that he lets out this godly sorrow because he should speak. It's not God's will that Job is just you know, silent altogether. No, there must be a response there. There needs to be some sort of confession and reaction. And so now again he speaks in chapter 42 and verse 2. I, I know, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. And in verse 3, he repeats the words which the Lord had spoken to him. You notice in verse 3, you might wonder why that is there, because it doesn't seem to fit in an actual sense of a reading. You know, when he says in verse 2, I know thou can, thou can do everything, and then he says, who is he that hideth counsel? It's almost as if the Lord, uh, Job is speaking to the Lord and saying that, but he's not. He's just um, uh, recounting and repeating the words that, Actually, God had said to him in chapter 38 and verse 3, in other words, Job is doing something very, very fundamental. He's taking the word of God and he's speaking it to himself. And he says, well, you know, who am I to do this? If you look at what the the words in verse 3 are really saying, who is he that hideth counsel? You could maybe phrase it in this particular way. Job, who are you to hide the counsel of, of the Almighty? Talking to himself, speaking to himself. It's good, it's good actions, it's wise living. Therefore have I uttered that that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I, I knew not. Now Job is admitting to something here. Uh, there are times when uh, Job had spoken things, some of which were uh, right and some of things were wrong. And of course, uh, we can all be like that, can't we, on occasions? Um, But what Job is doing here is a bit more comprehensive. He's not just saying, you know, some things are said were true, some things are wrong. What he's saying is this. Really, I've just said things that I don't understand. I'm lost here. I'm lost to know how to interpret the the providences of God. I'm I'm lost in awe and wonder of God and all of his ways. I, I can't answer your questions. And I've been speaking and I've been saying things and some things are right, some things are wrong. But he confesses here, these are words that are understood, not two things which are too wonderful for me. And he admits that by this sort of ignorance of speech, what he had done is darkened and hid counsel without actually having knowledge. I think this is very honest speaking here. We can do the same thing. We can darken the counsel of God by just saying things that we've never really thought through. We've responded and we've spoken in certain ways and we haven't thought it through first. We've not been careful. And so we, we certainly identify here with Job. And, and we, we see it here and we sympathize in the very height of our crisis. We, we can say things, and you know at times they might just be right. At other times they're, they're plainly wrong. But right or wrong, we're left acknowledging that the ways and the workings of God, they're beyond us. You can't search them out unto perfection, as Job says elsewhere. But what I want to encourage you here with is that in spite of all this, he didn't weaken his faith. He wasn't overwhelmed to the sense that he just then gave up. And his confidence in the Almighty God was not dislodged because look with me at verse 4 as I introduce us to our text in verse 5. He says, now with great confidence I beseech thee, I will speak, I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. He's, he's coming now with this sort of confidence now before the Almighty. He still was a firm believer in the Lord and his word. Despite God's dealings with Job being past this man's understanding and comprehension, now says, look, through all this, I've, I've come closer. And is that not the desire of our hearts that uh, whatever it may, takes and whatever it means, we're closer to him? So that really simply by way of introduction, I know it's detailed, but I think it's necessary. Just some few thoughts I can leave with you this evening. Uh, we should see God more clearly in our lives. A very simple thing to make. We should see God more clearly in our lives through various ways. Verse 5, he he says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see of thee. I trust that 
um, we understand what he's saying here. I, I trust it strikes a chord with us. And that we say, Job, I know what you're saying here. I've had that experience too. Now, Job is not saying something here that I need to explain uh, carefully. He's not um, stating the first occasion of his conversion. Some have suggested this. They said, well, Job now is converted because how could he possibly say this? You know, I've heard, but now I see. And some have come up with the ludicrous idea, well, this was the timing of Job's conversion, that beforehand, well, he was, he was tried because he wasn't a believer all along. But that, that just flies in the face with the whole of Job when he knows that his Redeemer liveth. And he offers the sacrifices, and he lives in the, in the fear of God. Now, it's something different here. When he says, I've heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, he's not referring to some casual hearing that may be, Many who are not saved have, they might hear the gospel, and they hear of God, and they hear of the gospel, but they don't go any further. That's not what he's talking about. He's not dealing with a lack of personal experience. When he says, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, do you know what he's saying? He's actually speaking of the most intimate times of fellowship. He's saying, look, I have heard, I have followed, I have sought to obey you. But he's realizing that he's not reached sort of the, the peak or the pinnacle. You can't do in this life as God's people. He knows with personal experience that there was still a greater understanding of God needed. Still a closer walk with the Lord. And this ought to be a desire of our hearts as the Lord's people this evening. That as we know him, that we desire to know him more. And if ever we get to a place where we are content with knowing what we do know. It's a worrying place to be. Let's be like the Apostle Paul, who in Philippians 3, in verse 10, um, sighed that great statement of Scripture that I may know him, Christ, and the power of his resurrection. There are many things that as God's people we can know, yet not see or experience. But the Lord would have us to be brought almost like face-to-face -face with God through certain ways and experiences, so that we say, I see him. Now, how do we qualify this language? He's not dealing with physical sight. That's not what he's dealing with. Just like he wasn't dealing with physical hearing. He's using two parts of those great senses that we have, because you might hear the description of something, but when you see that very thing, it has an altogether different impression upon you. And that is how Job is describing the degree of intimacy as he grows in his fellowship with God. He likens the first part and that initial walk as hearing, but now he sees it. So it's fuller, it's clearer, it's more in focus. It was Spurgeon who said, one eyewitness is better than ten ear witnesses. Isn't that not true? Ten people may hear of something and speak about something, but what is that compared to actually seeing it, seeing it for yourself? And it is in, in many respects, not always can you sort of make this jump into the realms of the invisible and faith, but in many respects in our physical sense, when we see things, well, it makes a far deeper impression upon us. In fact, we, we live in such a way that we're not going to believe someone unless we see it. And then what do we do? We go and tell someone else. And we expect them to trust our word. You know, they have to see it as well. So we live in that sort of world and we have that type of restriction upon us. And that's what Job is employing here. That's what he's trying to establish. He, he likens his advancing, his growth in the walk with God as, as if he's seen him. Now I see you. That's what he's saying. And so his faith was increased. And it wasn't until everything was taken away that Job had this clearer and more vivid impression of the Lord. Now, just for a, to quickly run through these things, because they are, they are common to us and familiar to us, well, how did he see him more clearly? How? Well, we know, first of all, it was through problems, and serious problems they were. The different ways in which Job saw God more clearly was the life experience which he had to suffer and the tragic afflictions that came his way. And it doesn't really need me to explain them because they are you know, familiar to us, I trust, this evening. And let's never under, uh, uh, under sort of estimate really into less than what happened to him. 
when you read of his complaints, because as I said at the very beginning, these are, these are times and moments that most of us have not, I would say all of us haven't really been um, experiencing and suffering in our lives. But it was for him a pathway. And it will be for us a pathway in some respect. God might bring you through problems that you might see him more clearly. One man said in prosperity, God is heard, and that is a blessing, but in adversity, God is seen, and that is a greater blessing. And again, it sort of overlaps what we're thinking with about David earlier on. We bless our God for temporal things, and rightly so. And we bless our God for all the uh, temporal blessings of health and strength, but you strip a man or woman of all these things. Will they bless him in the valley? Will they love him in the low times? For Job, that was it. Through the problems, he would see God more clearly. Now, if I try to then make the, the, the application in realms of those who are not saved, I am firmly convinced that this is God's method, that when you bring someone to saving faith, that he will trouble them that he will, in a sense, hurt them, that he will empty them of themselves. He will remove all the things they're relying upon, all their, their, their crutches, all their, uh, their rests, all their pillars, and he removes them all. You're weak. And, and as a way of showing himself to them and showing his son and showing that wonderful salvation, oh, there has to be a trouble. And it's right that as Christians, when we pray, if it be for loved ones or people we know, Lord, humble them. Lord, humble them. Take it all away. Show them what they need in Christ. It will be through problems we get to know him, see him more clearly. It will be through persecution. We all value friends and friendship, and rightly so, and especially Christian friends. And if we have good Christian friends, uh, we are in a good place, certainly, um, this evening. Sometimes friends are not always the most helpful. And people might come with you know, what they think is good advice and good words of counsel. And it's probably the last thing that you ever want to hear. And we, we might have all had that sort of experience. So it means well, it doesn't really come off in that same way. Uh, and Job had this sort of experience. Um, we, they have been dubbed you know, Job's comforters, but that's sort of ironic because they were anything but comforting to Job in his life, save maybe for the, the younger one at the end. In Job 42, verse 7, we discover that Job had erred at times, um, but many times was right, but his friends had not spoken what was right. That's the Lord's assessment. Um, so look at verse 7 there. It says, And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said, and he lists these men here, and he found the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right. Now this is a very interesting point. Well, for me it is anyway, because when you look at their, their words, there are times that technically things that they did say in a different setting would have been right. Maybe certain things about God that were in themselves the right thing, but they were not right for Job. And they were not right in that situation. And God says to these men, you have not said the right thing. Done wrong. And it's a rebuke for them. Job, of course, has to pray for them in response. I don't um, doubt they uh, were godly men. I believe they were men of God. I don't doubt their intentions. They were trying to do the right thing. What they found themselves doing, actually, was more reproving Job than trying to encourage him and help him. And in the depth of his grief, Job uttered foolish things, but they were miserable comforters, as you find out in chapter 16 and verse 2. And so I put this under the category of a type of persecution, not in the sense of persecution against the church, but in, in the hardship that comes through the wrong words of people. And when you realize that, well, what do you do? You rely more upon the Lord, don't you? That they, they might have the words I need, but God has the word I need. And their counsel is not what is helping me, but his counsel is what I must have. I must stand in the counsel of God. And then Job sees uh, the, the Lord more clearly uh, through power. It is through power. And I believe that this is the greatest sight that Job had. It was a tremendous sight. 
You know, he had, he had wanted, desired answers. You, you can't blame the man. Give me answers. Why? Why are my children? Why are my wife turning against me? Why my physical pain and sufferings? What have I done wrong? That's really how Job was thinking along the lines. At first, of course, he resigned himself to the, the will of God, but he began to uh, sort of question all these things. Unless the Lord, and I, and I want to emphasize this this evening, unless the Lord, on the Lord's behalf, gave a special manifestation of himself to Job, Job remains in a hardened condition. That's how serious it is. Unless the Lord stepped into time and showed himself to Job, Job remains cursing his day. He remains cursing the day of his birth. He remains in that bitterness. And so the Lord comes with the final means to reveal himself. It is through problems. It is through the, uh, the, the problematic words of people, if we can use that expression this evening. But it's through power. It's through showing himself unto Job, showing the glory of God. And that is the greatest of answer. And that's why the Lord, in those chapters that I mentioned about Leviathan and, and previous to that, God is saying, Job, this is me. Can you do these things? I know you can't, but I can. I can do all these things. I am the great and the almighty God. And you know, that was it, wasn't it? That was the, the way in which... It opened his eyes. He's humbled. He's humbled in the presence of the Almighty. And finally, uh, as we see um, the true picture of God, we then, as a result, see ourselves with more honesty within this light. With more honesty. Can you notice with me the response of Job now? He says in verse 5, as we've looked at, but now my eye is CFD. Now let's look at the reaction of Job as we finish this evening. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. You can often hear those words being said to you by people. You can hear many Christians speaking in that sort of language. Well, we should, because this is the, exactly the right response of Job. And it's precisely what I mean by seeing God and then yourself. You do it the other way around. You're never going to come to that conclusion. You're not going to get the average Joe Bloggs in the street and he comes to them and say, well, is this a fair assessment of how you feel about yourself? Do you abhor yourself? Do you loathe yourself? Not just, and it's not dealing here with hating our very life and the living that we have and what we have. That's not what Job is doing here. But he's looking at his unbelief. He's looking at the sins of his speech. He's looking at all the ways in which he's betrayed the Lord and let the Lord down, even though he was tried in such a way. And he says, I pour myself. So I see how undone I am in this respect. As I indicated at the outset, many people will do it the other way around, won't they? They will excuse sin or ignore the reality of God, and they look at themselves, and then they look at God. And that's their decision-making process, and it's all wrong. Job saw God unchangeable in his holiness, eternal in his being, infinite in his ways, far above the ways of man. And what did he see about himself? Why am I a speck? I'm not even a grasshopper. I am but the dust of the earth. And so we then notice his reflection, and he says, I am poor. You notice the word myself is in italics, as we indicate there often, um, uh, the, 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 the sort of literal Hebrew is of a very emphatic nature, I abhor. So he's talking of himself. Everything he says. I'm, I'm undone here. I abhor myself. And he knows that now that God is the one who sinned against. God is the one that sin has offended. He, he, earlier on, he's realized that there is a redeemer in Christ or in the promised one, Messiah. He will see him one day. He will, in that flesh with which he suffered with, he will see him. But he sees himself, as he should. And again, Spurgeon says here, the more you appreciate God, the more you will uh, depreciate yourself. And that's, that's a good thing. You might not think it is, or people won't think it's like this, but it's a good thing. 
It's humble living, isn't it? Leads us into humility of our heart. And again, it's the entrance of the gospel. It's the entrance of the gospel. There is no, there is no way in anyone ever become a Christian who has this low, poor view of God and then seeks to sort of stroll into the kingdom of heaven, uh, okay as they are. Those who are born of God and saved by the grace of God, they're brought to that place of true contrition of sin and repentance on their knees and before their face. They will say such things, I pour myself. The word means loathe. That's really what the word is saying here. And then we see not just it, that sort of uh, reflection, but we see his repentance. And he says he repents in dust and ashes. Very typical and very uh, striking language which he employs here. Um, interesting to see that at the outset in chapter 2 of Job, in verse 8, he takes a pot share to scrape himself with all, and he sits down among the ashes, doesn't he? At the very beginning of the trials, he's among the ashes. And at the end of it all, he's among the ashes. He's, he's right there again. In other words, that in his affliction, his sorrow was great, but also in his repentance. Again, it reminds me of David and our message this morning as he went up Mount uh, Olivet in grief and repentance. So that legitimate grief is allowed in the first. He's mourning, isn't he? Rightfully is he mourning the loss of loved ones and pain and suffering. And he's in the ashes, and he's right to be there. He's right to be there. We don't despise legitimate mourning. But the other aspect is also necessary. Because as he goes through and he makes mistakes and he, and he regrets things, as we shall see, he must be among the ashes again. He must repent. You might wonder when you look at Job's life, what could Job possibly repent of? You know, if it was me, it would be a catalogue of things. But Job, what have you got to repent of, Job? Chapter 3, verse to one, 1 to 3, he cursed the day of his death or his birth. He cursed the day of his birth. There was a sense of suicide, maybe circling his mind and his thoughts. I don't want to be here anymore. Chapter 6, there he desired to die. Chapter 7, 9, and 10, he complained against God. He darkened knowledge of God. So, well, he's got plenty to repent of. And we would be just the same. But he sits among the ashes and he sees God more clearly. But do you know something very interesting as I finish this evening? His repentance was the doorway to comfort. Do you know why? Because the word repentance here in the Hebrew signifies comfort. You wouldn't think that. But when you look at the root word and you go to Genesis 24 and verse 67 within the Hebrew, uh, what you find is this, that, and it's a completely different um, narrative altogether, but it's, the, it's a word study and it's a very good one to help us uh, understand this word uh, when he says repent in verse 6. So there in Genesis 24 and 67, it says Isaac brought her into, that is Rebekah, into her, his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah to, and she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The word comfort, even though you don't, wouldn't think it, is in the same word family as repent. And so Isaac, after his grief, was comforted by Rebekah, and it's that same word in the original, so we can rightly say that when Job repented, it became, in many respects, the entrance, and the doorway, and the opening of lasting comfort. The door of repentance, as one said, opens the halls of joy. And as that, that is so... Um, unlike what people think, isn't it? When they think of repentance, they think of, you know, um, uh, harming yourself. They think of doing things to uh, pacify God in some respects. No, it's nothing of the kind. Repentance unto life, that's what it is in Scripture. A turning away from sin unto Christ, who is your comfort and your joy. And what do you find at the end of Job here? When he repents, God comforts him. God comforts him. And by what a comfort it was, he gives to him double the blessing, double the things which he had lost. Uh, when we repent of our sin, we are comforted in our blessed Savior. He clothes us, he washes us, and he restores us. 
and we are brought to a place where we see God and then we see ourselves. May God bless his word to our hearts. Amen.